Hello, ladies and gentlemen of American History 2. Uh, this week's video is on a time period known as the Progressive Era, which is the time period we're going to be dwelling in for the next uh, four or five weeks. Uh, today's video is designed to give you a introduction to the Progressive Era and to talk about some of the main challenges that progressives faced and some of the strategies they used to resolve these problems. Here are your video goals. So the root of the Progressive Era comes from the emergence of industrialism in the United States. As we learned about in our last unit, uh, the Second Industrial Revolution had led to a huge industrial boom in the United States. And by the year 1900, America was essentially an industrial country. Huge cities and factories dominated the economy. And these cities continued to grow, and factories and other heavy industry continued to expand. As a result of this industrial expansion, huge industrial trusts controlled government through buying off corrupt representatives. They were able to set high prices on consumer goods, that is, charge more than they really should have. And they were able to force workers to accept very low wages and terrible working conditions. Partially as a result of this, millions of poor workers lived in poverty. So even though America is now the richest country in the world and has the most powerful industry of anybody in the world, millions of Americans are still living in poverty. And it looks like things are just going to get worse. It's in order to address these problems that the progressive movement develops. So the progressives were a very uh, diverse group. They came from all different levels of American society, and they, a lot of them had very different beliefs, but they could all agree that the in, emergence of industrialism had created some pretty terrible problems and they wanted to work together to change the United States government and therefore address the problems that had come about from the Industrial Revolution. And so the groups that got involved um, were several. One of the most important groups was the educated middle class. In previous years, the educated middle class, people like lawyers and doctors and teachers, university professors, had tended to be pretty conservative and to support big business. But as trusts continued to develop and as industrialism continued, these people, these uh, college educated people, started to realize that the big businesses were becoming too powerful and risked even eliminating the power of the educated middle class. So these guys used their education and their money and their influence to try and fight back against big business and corrupt government. Another group that got involved with progressivism were urban industrial workers, that is the factory workers that we've talked so much about. These guys continue to organize unions, but they also start to vote for progressive candidates who will fix some of the problems that they're facing. Rural farmers, who we talked about with the populist movement, realize that the progressives stand for much of the same stuff as the populist movement did. So the rural farmers also get on board. And last of all, recent immigrants come in with lots of progressive ideas. Socialism is a very powerful force in Europe. And so when these European immigrants show up, they already have very strong ideas about how government should work to make life better for people. So all of these groups, even though they come from different parts of the country and different uh, socioeconomic classes, decide to work together to try and fix the United States government. And basically what they try to do is they try to change the way the government works in order to solve these problems. So what exactly did the progressives want? Well, they wanted a couple things. First of all, they wanted to control capitalism. They wanted government to step in and control the power of giant corporations. 
Uh, they also wanted the government to work to improve the lives of workers, and they wanted to protect consumers from uh, high prices and from low quality goods that companies were putting out. So they wanted the government to step in in order to hold the big corporations and the trusts responsible. They also wanted to improve the quality of government. So one of the things they wanted was to make sure that the government worked for everybody and not just for the rich people. And they wanted to eliminate corruption. And these two goals go together. So by eliminating corruption, the progressives could hope to make government responsible for the welfare of everybody and not just for the welfare of the rich. So what strategies did the progressives use? Well, the progressives used a number of different strategies, and um, we're going to examine all of these strategies in this video. They used journalistic exposure, they expanded the role of government, they implemented ideas about scientific management, and they also relied on mass organization in order to get things done. So we're going to take a little bit of time and look at each one of these different strategies to see how the progressives used these to get the job done. So one of the most effective methods used by the progressives is something called journalistic exposure. And the idea behind journalistic exposure is to just show the bad stuff that is happening. If you can just show bad stuff that is happening to enough people, then those people will rise up and try to change it. That was the belief anyway. And this was now possible in the United States because of a change in the way people got their news. People used to get their news from local magazines, but recently uh, we see the rise of national news magazines. So these are magazines that are printed and distributed all around the country. So anything that is printed in this article or in this magazine is not just seen by people in a local town, but is seen by hundreds of thousands of people all across the country. And this is important because once enough people learn about a problem, they can get together and work to change it. The most influential journalists who use this technique are known as muckrakers. Uh, basically, what, the, what they do is they use their journalistic skills to seek out the problems in America. They look for the, uh, the problems and the challenges posed by industrial America and then try to show it to the whole world. Um, that way, because people now know about a problem, they can work to fix it. They're called muckrakers because they basically get down into the dirty, into the disgusting parts of American life and take pictures of it and show it to everybody. A couple of very famous muckrakers are Ida Tarbell and Upton Sinclair. So Ida Tarbell, Tarbell was famous for publishing a history of the Standard Oil Company. She spent a lot of time doing research on John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company and was able to show how Rockefeller used illegal and immoral practices to build up his oil uh, monopoly. And so by showing how Standard Oil was uh, breaking rules and breaking down the competition, Ida Tarbell was able to work up uh, anger against Standard Oil, which helped lead to its eventual breakup. Upton Sinclair, even more famously, in his novel, The Jungle, showed the world the utter grossness of American slaughterhouses and meat packing plants. So these were plants in big cities like Chicago or Cincinnati, where millions of animals were killed and butchered every year and packaged up as steaks and sausages. Upton Sinclair, in his book, showed, first of all, how badly the slaughterhouse workers were treated, but secondly, showed how gross these slaughterhouses were. There's guts and all sorts of disgustingness, rotting meat, 
and Upton Sinclair shows how all of this is going into the food people are eating. This made this made people so sick that they immediately rose up to try and fix this problem, which ultimately led to laws regulating the sanitation of slaughterhouses. So both Ida Tarbell and Upton Sinclair used journalism to show people how there were problems in order to motivate people to go fix those problems. Another aspect of muckraking that had to do with modern technology was photography. Photography was getting better and better and it was getting cheaper and cheaper to take pictures. And so they were able to use photography to show all of the awful stuff to people. You ever Have you ever heard the uh, saying that a photo is worth a thousand words? The muckrakers understood this and used photography to really give people a sense of how bad stuff was. You can read about child laborers, but it's a different thing to see pictures of them. And so they would use photography to show people just how bad things really were. And you can see a picture there of child laborers taken by muckraking journalists. Another important strategy used by the progressives was expanding the role of government. Basically, what the progressives wanted to do is they wanted to make government more powerful in order to stop big businesses. When the United States first began, big businesses were not very powerful. Most businesses were small. But as the Industrial Revolution happens, businesses got bigger and the American government stayed the same. So the progressives said that in order to stop big business, the government had to grow also. So uh, what they wanted the government to do exactly was they wanted it to break up trusts. They wanted the government to use the Sherman Antitrust Act, which had already been passed, to break up the country's most powerful monopolies. Also, they wanted the government to pass laws in order to make sure that workplaces were safe and that the products produced were healthy and of high quality. So, for example, they wanted the government to step in and make sure that slaughterhouses weren't putting rotten meat in the sausages. Also, progressives wanted the government to provide basic services to citizens. And this happens pretty quickly on a local basis. Cities all over America elect progressive leaders, and these progressives do kind of do the same thing all over the place. They increase local taxes, that is they charge, they, they take more money from their citizens. And then using this money, they pay for new services like public schools, parks, better police forces, garbage collection, all this basic stuff. So using those taxes, they start to provide basic services to everybody, whether they're rich or poor. Now, some people would argue that this is an example of socialism. Uh, socialism is basically where the government takes money from everybody and then uses that money to provide services for everybody. And so I guess you can see by looking at that definition that the progressives actually were, in a sense, socialists. They took money from everybody, especially from the richest people in the cities, and used that money to provide services that benefited everybody, rich and poor. Um, so in a way, the progressives are the first sort of socialistic movement in the United States. Another big strategy used by progressives was something called scientific management. And scientific management is a pretty simple idea. It basically says that we should use scientific principles and scientific research in order to run businesses and governments more effectively. And they basically they believe that by using science, we would be able to increase the efficiency both of production and of government. One really interesting example that we see in this is that some towns decide that rather than electing government officials, that they will appoint unelected experts to run the government. Maybe not all parts of the government, but certain parts of the city government would be run by university-educated experts in economics, in planning, in um, sociology, 
all that stuff. They believed that science and people who studied science were better at governing than uh, normal people. Also, factories started to use science to make workers more productive. Uh, so they would implement precise rules based on data and research in order to increase worker production. Two very famous examples of this come from uh, a guy named Taylor and a guy named Ford. So Taylor came up with the idea of measuring worker output and limiting task activity. And so giving very, very specific rules to workers and also giving very specific targets for worker productivity. And one of, uh, so Taylor would tell you exactly what to do, exactly what motion to make with your hand. And he would also limit all sorts of stuff. So you would be limited, for example, for the number of times that you could go to the bathroom and this would be kept tracked of. Um, so workers would work for a certain amount of time. There would be a very short regimented break and then workers would go back to perform the same task again. So Taylor thought that by controlling the worker at every level, he would be able to increase the output of that worker. Taylor's ideas, interestingly enough, ultimately made their way into public schools. And so public schools with their 40 minute class periods and their bells and their five minute breaks are actually based on Taylor's idea of scientific management. Another guy who applied scientific management was Henry Ford, who came up with the idea of the moving assembly line. So Ford, who wanted to make cars, realized that you could make a car much faster if you, instead of moving workers to the car, moved the car to the worker. So cars were put on a moving line and each worker would stand there and perform one very simple task over and over and over again. So if you worked for Henry Ford, you didn't actually build a car, you simply did one little part of the job. So you screwed in one screw, you put on one tire, that sort of thing. This made work very, very boring for the individual worker, but it enabled Ford to produce millions of cars. And one last strategy used by the progressives was mass organization. So basically, mass organization was a strategy used by groups who otherwise lacked political power. So some of the most important mass organization groups are listed here. Women, or at least a significant proportion of American women, organize uh, along the lines, uh, organize into feminist organizations. And these feminist groups try to fight for women's rights. They want women's right to vote, but also a woman's right to birth control, uh, maternity leave from work, all that stuff. And we're gonna look at that much more closely in a later video. Another group that organizes um, is African-Americans. So during the progressive era, most African-Americans still live in the South and are still suffering from segregation and widespread racism. In order to combat, combat this, they found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, also known as the NAACP, which is still around and is still a very important political organization. And the NAACP uh, takes actions to fight for racial equality. Another group that uses mass organization is unskilled workers. So as you already know, the American Federation of Labor which we talked about in our last unit, was a union set up to support skilled laborers, that is, people who had some special abilities that when they worked in the factory. But other workers, people who didn't have any particular skills, street sweepers, uh, I don't know, porters, people who just carry stuff around, truck drivers, these guys don't have special skills really. But the uh, they still believed that they deserved a good life. And so they also organized in order to try and improve their condition. And they set up an organization called the International Workers of the World, also known as the IWW, also known as the Wobblies. These guys were a socialistic organization that called for equality for all workers. 
and they basically argued that capitalism was bad and should be overthrown. So these were a pretty radical bunch. But they were able to get millions of people to join up and to support this sort of socialistic uh, approach to unionization. So they're sort of like a radical labor union for everybody, not just for skilled workers. And last of all, we have the prohibitionists. And uh, these are people who want to make alcohol illegal. The people who start up this movement call themselves the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And it is mostly women who support prohibition. Uh, they, they argue that men who work in factories, instead of coming home and spending their money on the family, instead go to bars or saloons, as they called them back then, and spend their money drinking beer instead. And so the prohibitionists want to outlaw alcohol because they believe it will make life better for women and children. All these different groups work together, uh, or all these different groups form up and try to get as many people on board as possible. So they use publications, that is like magazines and newspapers. They use public protests. They also use lobbying in order to fight for political recognition. And these groups are pretty successful in gaining national recognition and in also, uh, in some cases, pressuring the government to take action. And we'll see in later videos what happens to all these different groups.